Good afternoon. Welcome to Learn at Home with VIA. My name is Mrs. Newlander Jones, and I am a biology teacher at Pocono Mountain East High School. Today, I will be sharing some information about ecology and ecological interactions related to today's programming. When we study ecology, we're looking at interactions among organisms and interactions between organisms and their environment. We look at organisms' ecological niche or their role in their specific environment. This would include things like the food that an organism eats, how it accesses its shelter or what it uses for shelter, how it gains resources, what other types of organisms it interacts with. All of these things are described in an ecological niche for an organism. The competitive exclusion principle is that two different species will not have the exact same ecological niche. Some species in an environment will have a lot of overlap in their, in their niche. So for example, a chipmunk and a squirrel have a lot of similarities. They eat similar types of food. They have a similar kind of body plan. They have similar types of predators. However, they are not exactly the same in their niche. A squirrel tends to utilize trees and inhabit trees more frequently than a chipmunk does that tends to be more of a rock dwelling ground kind of organism. Some things that will affect an organism's role in its environment include its location in the globe, so where specifically it is located, what kind of climate is it adapting to, the geography of that particular area are all going to affect an organism's role and its needs in its environment. Additionally, the distribution of other species or the biogeography is going to affect an organism's role. These different species of warblers live in the same environment and even occupy the same species of tree. However, they do not have a complete overlap in their ecological niche. Instead, each species occupies a different area of the tree. This will help to limit the amount of competition that they have for similar resources. We can study ecology by looking at different levels of complexity. The most specific level in ecology is that of the species. A species is defined as a group of individuals that can successfully mate to produce fertile offspring. A fruit fly and a banana would not be of the same species because they do not reproduce. Species are then grouped together to form a population. A population of organisms that's common in Northeast Pennsylvania are white-tailed deer. A community groups all of the populations in a given area. So in Northeast PA, we might look at white-tailed deer, as well as rhododendron, as well as chipmunks or rattlesnakes. Those would all be members of the same community. Communities are then grouped together into an ecosystem, which also includes the non-living things in the environment. So when we study the level of the ecosystem, we look not only at living populations, but also non-living things such as the location of a stream or a mountain range or a group of rocks. Biomes group ecosystems that have the same climate and the same types of living populations. Some common biomes that you might be familiar with are a temperate forest bio biome such as what we live in, or a tundra, or a desert, or a tropical rainforest. All of the biomes are grouped into a biosphere. The biosphere just refers to the planet as a whole. This illustrates the ecological levels of organization, starting with an individual or species, the population or the species within a given area, the community or the groups of populations within a given area, an ecosystem or the groups of communities as well as the non-living things, the biomes, and then the biosphere. The level of the ecosystem is what we primarily focus on when studying ecology, because it's important to know not only how living things interact with one another, but how they are also influenced by non-living things in their environment. Organisms need to respond to things that are happening in their environment in order to live successfully. This could be fleeing from a predator, finding shelter from a rainstorm, or growing longer roots to access water and nutrients. Generally, responses require some kind of chemical signaling that will allow for a physiological or a behavioral response to occur. 
all individuals in an environment will need to respond to things that are happening around them in order to be successful. Photoperiodism is a specific response to change in day length, the amount of sun or the amount of darkness that's available during the course of a day. This is a strategy that's utilized by plants in order to signal growth and reproductive cycles. Short day plants are plants that will start their reproductive cycle after the amount of darkness has exceeded some critical amount necessary for that particular plant. Long day plants are plants that will start their reproductive cycle only when the amount of darkness is less than some critical amount necessary for that plant. Plants are triggered by the amount of darkness or the amount of light that's available in the day so that they are reproducing at the same time as other members of their species and can be more successful. Another type of response is phototropism. In phototropism, plants will grow towards the direction of light. You may have seen this if you have a house plant that grows towards a window. Plants are triggered to grow towards light because they utilize light for photosynthesis in order to make their food. In some plants, the chemical auxin is used to stimulate growth of cells on one side of the plant that will cause one side to elongate and allow the plant to move in the direction of light. Another method of response utilized by some organisms is movement. Movement can either occur as taxis or kinesis. Taxis refers to movement in a straight line. You can think of it like a taxi that generally drives in a straight line towards the direction that it's destined to go. Kinesis refers to random movement. In the picture on the bottom here, you see a bug moving in a form of kinesis. It has kind of a zigzaggy pattern that doesn't seem as directed as the fish that's moving using taxis. Communication is necessary for all organisms to be successful in their environment. From a unicellular bacteria to multicellular elephant, all living things need to communicate in order to be successful. There are a variety of ways that different living things can communicate, and organisms use a variety of these methods. Much of our signaling is chemical. Like the example of the ants in the background picture, they will utilize a chemical signal to follow a path to food or a path back to their home. We commonly think of methods of communication that we use such as speaking and listening or looking at pictures. But there are a variety of methods for communication and that communication allows organisms to display different information in their environment. Communication can be useful for finding food, finding water, finding shelter, or finding other resources. It's also beneficial for organisms that are establishing a territory or some particular boundary. It helps organisms to get mates or to find access to mates. It also helps to establish dominance, particularly in social communities. Communication is important in natural selection. Organisms that successfully communicate have behaviors that will likely increase their ability to survive and reproduce. Those are behaviors that are going to be selected for by nature and passed on to future generations. Cooperative behavior and communication within groups helps to increase the fitness not only of an individual, but other organisms within that population. Organisms can use physical means of signaling or communicating with their environment. On the left, we see examples of camouflage. The lizard on the tree, the leaf bug, or the seahorse all blend in well with their environment. This allows them to hide successfully from predators or competitors, or to hide successfully from their prey items. On the top, we can see examples of startle coloration. The eye spots on the moth or bright colors can warn a predator or scare a predator so that it doesn't eat that organism. On the bottom right, we see some warning coloration. Often bright colors are used to warn a, pre a potential predator or a potential competitor not to mess with that organism. But skunks also use a form of warning coloration by their characteristic black and white stripe. If you're sprayed by the noxious fumes of a skunk, you're not likely to forget that pattern. Some species will mimic the characteristic of other species, and this will give them improved fitness. 
In this example, a wasp has a distinct black and yellow coloration that serves as a warning to organisms. The warning is that the wasp can sting and that causes a lot of pain and harm to the organism. A malarian mimic has the same type of characteristic and the same harmful effect. This bee also has a black and yellow coloration and it also stings. So it reinforces to organisms that black and yellow stripes are something that they should avoid. However, the Batesian mimic, in this case, the hoverfly, also has the black and yellow warning coloration without the harmful sting. It benefits from having organisms avoid it, but it wouldn't actually cause the same harm as a wasp or a bee. The anglerfish uses a form of mimicry that allows it to gain access to prey. It mimics bioluminescence that would attract smaller fish to its area. The smaller fish coming close to the anglerfish then get gobbled up for lunch. Each of these pictures demonstrates a method of communication or response. Whether it's to indicate dominance or the range of a territory, such as urination or scratching, to indicate family relationships or to serve as a lookout, to swarm to indicate the presence of a predator or some kind of harmful organism in the environment, or to serve as a way to signal migration. Organisms, whether it's animals shown here, plants, fungi, bacteria, all use different methods to communicate and be successful in their environments. One particularly interesting form of communication is a waggle dance performed by some species of honeybee. When a honeybee has found a source of food, it will return to the hive and perform its waggle dance to indicate the location of that food source. The length of the waggle dance, as well as the position of the dance, will indicate to other members of the hive where that food is located so that they can also access that food source. There are several different ways that living things will interact in their environment. The first is competition. Competition is when two individuals try to gain access to the same resource at the exact same time. That resource could include food, water, shelter, or access to a mate. If the competition is between organisms of different species, then it's said to be interspecific competition. If the competition occurs between organisms that are of the same species, then it's intraspecific competition. Predation occurs when one organism kills another organism as a food source. The organism that does the killing is the predator, whereas the individual who is killed is the prey item. Symbiosis refers to a close living relationship among organisms within different species. This is often a long-term kind of relationship. These pictures represent different methods of interaction. On the top, we see predation as that lion is attacking and killing the water buffalo. Interspecific competition is shown between the hyena and the lion as they're trying to gain access to that food. Intraspecific competition is shown between these elephants fighting over territory or access to a female. There are four different types of symbiotic relationships that differ based on the effect of the species involved. The first is mutualism. Mutualism occurs when both species interacting benefit from the relationship. Bees and flowers are a good example of a mu mutualistic relationship. Bees benefit from their interaction with flowers because they gain access to nectar that they can use as a food source. Flowers benefit because the bees carry pollen that's useful in fertilization. Both species benefit from their relationship and are dependent on one another. In commensalism, one individual benefits from the relationship and there's no effect on the other. Birds in a tree are an example of a commensalistic relationship. Birds benefit from interacting with a tree because they can build a nest and gain access to shelter that's safe from predators. However, there's no effect on the tree. It's neither harmed nor helped by the bird building a nest in it. Immensalism occurs when one individual in a relationship is harmed, but there's no effect on the other. Herds of animals running across grassland are an example of an immensalistic relationship. 
The grass is harmed, but the herds are not. Parasitism is an example of a relationship where one organism benefits and the other is harmed. In this type of relationship, the organism benefiting is referred to as a parasite, and the organism that is harmed is referred to as a host. Tapeworms are a good example of a parasite that feeds off the nutrients of the host, harming it in the process. These pictures illustrate some symbiotic relationships. The mosquito is an example of a parasite that is drawing blood from its host. The host is harmed as a result and also may suffer the effects of diseases that are carried by the mosquito. The herding zebra demonstrate immensalism. They're trampling the grass, but there's no harm to them and no effect on them at all. The bee and the flower represent a mutualistic relationship that allows them to both benefit. And the bird on the rhino demonstrates a commensalistic relationship where the bird is benefiting, but there's no effect on the, on the rhino. All living things need to gain access to energy in order to survive. Energy is necessary for growth, for finding a mate, for gaining access to shelter, for pretty much everything that an organism needs in order to survive. Organisms also use energy as a way to regulate their body temperature. Animals can be broken into two groups based on how they regulate their internal temperature. Endotherms are organisms that regulate their internal temperature without influence from the external environment. They do so by regulating biochemical processes. Mammals and birds are examples of endotherms. Ectotherms are organisms that rely on the external environment to change their internal temperature. Reptiles and amphibians, for example, are ectotherms. If you ever see a snake out on a rock sunning itself, it's gaining access to heat from the outside to heat its internal body. When organisms have a net gain of energy, it allows them to survive and grow and to reproduce. When organisms lose energy, that causes them to die. In ecology, we can look at flow of energy by looking at an organism's trophic level or its feeding level. That refers to what an organism eats and what might eat that organism. On Earth, the main source of energy for all life is the sun. Sunlight is harnessed in the process of photosynthesis that creates a form of chemical energy that other organisms can utilize as a source of food. Ecosystems follow the first law of thermodynamics, which is that energy is neither created nor destroyed. In an ecosystem, energy is transferred from one organism to the next, generally through consumption or through eating. Not all of that chemical energy is used by the organism that does the consuming, but a lot of that energy is lost as heat. In an ecosystem, the base trophic level is that of the producers. Producers include things like plants that undergo photosynthesis to produce their own food, but it could also include things like specialized bacteria that use chemosynthesis, a similar process, to also create their own food. Producers are so named because they are producing food. They're also referred to as autotrophs. Producers serve as the base level in an ecosystem. Organisms that eat producers are referred to as primary consumers or first level consumers. Organisms that eat primary consumers are referred to as secondary consumers or the second level of consumer. And organisms that eat secondary consumers are referred to as tertiary consumers or the third level of consumption. If you notice in this energy pyramid, there is a reduced amount of energy available at the higher trophic level, the level of the tertiary consumer. That's because consumption does not allow an organism to gain access to all of the potential chemical energy in its food source. Instead, only about 10% of the chemical energy is transferred to the consumer, and most of the energy is instead lost as heat. Detritivores and decomposers are another example of consumption. Detritivores are organisms that eat detritus, or dead or non-living particles. The long-horned beetles and the termites are examples of detritivores that are feeding off the dead parts of this tree. 
decomposers differ from detritivores because when they are consuming living flesh, they are going to recycle that material and deposit it back into the environment, generally by leaching it into the soil. The mushrooms shown here are an example of a decomposer that's breaking down the plant tissue and then recycling those nutrients in the soil. Energy flow in an ecosystem can be illustrated in a number of ways. This is an example of a food chain. A food chain shows a one-to-one -one relationship of organisms showing the flow of energy in one direction. In this case, we start with the producer that's shown here as grass. A grasshopper eats the grass, so it is a primary consumer. The frog is a secondary consumer that eats the grasshopper. The snake is a tertiary consumer that eats the frog. In this case, we have a hawk as the quaternary or final consumer in this food chain. In a food chain, we represent the organism that does the eating by showing the arrow pointing to that organism. A more complicated display is a food web, but a food web is a more realistic depiction of what happens in an ecosystem. An organism typically does not eat only one food source, so a food web shows all of the possible feeding interactions in an ecosystem. Again, like in the food chain, the arrow points to the organism that's doing the eating. Another trophic level display is a food pyramid. At the base of the pyramid, we see the producers, followed by the primary consumers, the secondary consumers, and the tertiary consumers making up the small triangle on top. Changes in energy that's available in an ecosystem can have a great impact on the success of the ecosystem as a whole. For example, in a desert where there's a limiting nutrient of water, there are not always an abundant amount of producers. Where there are not producers, primary consumers cannot survive, secondary consumers can't survive without primary consumers, and tertiary consumers can't survive without secondary consumers. A change at any trophic level can cause a great impact in an ecosystem. In this example of a trophic cascade, the top predators in the environment, like the bears and the wolves, are removed from this ecosystem. There's going to be impacts on the other trophic levels when the top predators are no longer there. If top predators are not in the ecosystem, then large prey items, like deer or elk, can survive more successfully in that ecosystem. They can then consume grass and shrubs more frequently than they would have if top predators were in this environment. A trophic cascade is named because a cascade of events or a cascade of changes will occur due to a disruption in one trophic level. I hope you take the time to go outside and explore your ecosystem today. Look for some of the things that we talked about in today's lesson. Can you find any signs of mimicry? What about different forms of symbiosis? Thanks for watching and for joining me on Learn at Home with VIA.